Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 19 of Rise Up, the podcast. And boy, do we have a special episode in store for you guys today. A little bit different than what we've done in the past. It's an interview heavy episode with the one and only Paul Carcaterra. We are so happy to have him on the podcast. Absolute legend. And fellas, you know, before we get into that interview, you want to give me a quick recap of your weekends? I know, Scotty, you've been traveling. You're doing the PLL camps. How we doing? Dude, I'm grinding. I've been traveling six weeks straight. I know Greg has no sympathy for this because he does it all the time, but I, <laughs> I'm grinding, but I'm okay. Made some money. Hey man, being a, being a lacrosse person is all about grinding. That's, that's just what we got to do. Agreed. Entrepreneurial spirit. This past weekend, I took the boys down to my parents' house, um, Nana and Poppy down to uh, Philly, gave my wife the weekend off to just chill. And, uh, my boys didn't sleep particularly well on the road. So I had very little sleep over the weekend. So when I got home, I kind of Quick handoff, quick pitch to the to the wife. Hope you enjoyed your weekend. Dad's got to go to bed at like eight Leave tonight. Me alone, right? um, but I'm I'm back on I'm back on the wagon now. I'm good to go. Love that. There it is. And as always, this episode is sponsored by Roback. Make sure you use promo code Rise Up Twenty to get all of your Roback merch. It's cold out here in New York right now. I'm rocking my hoodie. I'm rocking my collared shirts to work. I love wearing the gear. It feels like athletic gear, but you know, looks. Just a, you know, a little bit nicer. And we're always happy that Rollback hooks us up here on the podcast. So make sure you go get your Rollback gear using promo code RISEUP20. And I'll throw a nice little special shout out to the Face Off Academy and 42 Performance. I know these two here on the podcast are always grinding, always doing their thing. The best face off training in the world, the best goalie training in the world. If you don't follow these guys on Instagram, make sure you do because you see, I see Scotty training with the rubber bands, getting those kids working, doing the foot ladders. They're working hard, and Scotty doesn't put up with no shit. And Greg, you know, breaks down face-offs, all nope. different types. And make sure you go check these two out to get the best face-off and goalie training in the world. How about Damn, that gas? How about that gas? Oh, that was electric. Thanks for that. You know, it's funny, actually, on the group chat, we were talking today, maybe a few future Rise Up podcast clinics, pro player combines. Absolutely. Oh, Sibes teaching some O, Scotty doing the goalies. I'll get the face-off men going. Yep. I, just, I like just, it. Just teaching kids how to that. catch and shoot. Can't teach kids how to dodge too well. But <laughs> You can hammer the ball. Hey, if they move the ball right, they don't have to dodge. Exactly. Well – we got in store a very special episode, like I mentioned before, Paul Carcaterrier. We're going to get into a little bit of college across, a little bit of high school across, a little bit of what we're looking forward to seeing this year, and a little bit of breakdown from week zero. Uh, there was a lot that happened, you know, in this week zero. There were some good games. We had Syracuse uh, pulling a close one out against UVM. We had Maryland, you know, showing us why they're still, you know, the defending champs. But as we get further, you know, further episodes in, we're going to have more exclusive, more deliberate breakdowns. We're going to have picks. This is going to be your one-stop shop for everything PLL, but also college in the season. We have some PLL news coming out of the gates that we're going to keep you informed with. The Sixes tournament's coming up. There was just some announcement about the World Games and the schedule. I know everyone on this podcast is super excited about that. Make sure you tune in and we will be your updates for everything in the world of lacrosse. Crush that. Sibes, I don't even want to get in the way of you right now, man. You're like a locomotive. Listen, <laughs> we had Kark on, and all of a sudden, I think I think it's like the make me like Mike, you know, put on the shoes, and all of a sudden I can talk. <laughs> oh, He's inspired. The last thing I want to touch on is that uh, my Villanova Wildcats are playing Greg's Penn State Nittany Lions this weekend. Big game between the podcast. And Scotty's uh, Notre Dame Irishmen are still preparing for their uh, season debut, and we'll be sure to break that down when they're yeah, we'll game play them for Yeah, I mean, they always start late. What's up with that? They want to be every like time, an dude, every time. He likes to practice. He really does like to use the practice time. Well, that's why they're so good. I'm pulling for – besides Villanova, I'm pulling for Notre Dame this year. I just listened to a Coach Corgan interview on the Inside Lacrosse podcast. And, you know, 35 years he's been there building that program up, and he's been so close. I mean, I want him to get one. So I'm, I'm pulling for Notre Dame. I, I was in South Bend a couple of weeks ago, and Notre Dame is a plus 500 on the futures, and I definitely took that. I think Notre Dame can get over the hump this year. Will yeah. Lynch looks great. 
Uh, something we haven't seen much of in the history of Notre Dame lacrosse is a dominant faceoff man. And Will Lynch gives them a very good chance at it. Could have used that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, without, without further ado, I don't want to get into Paul Clark's way. Let's turn it over to that interview with Paul. Man, I had such a blast. I, I hope he comes back on. I'll tell you guys that. Hell yeah. A very warm welcome to the podcast, Paul Carcaterra. You know him as the voice of lacrosse on ESPN. We're so pumped to have you on. Uh, Yorktown alumni, Syracuse alumni, such a pleasure having you on, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. Like, you know, going into podcasts and being a guest, I oftentimes ask myself, like, what's the angle here, man? Are these guys going to be coming after me, ripping me? <laughs> Is it going to be more of like... What's the latest in college lacrosse projections with the PLL? Are you going to try to like find some no, no, crazy angles about my past? Come on, mm. Come on Kark. Mm. You know, I'm here, man. It's a safe space. You know that. I love it. I love it. Well, Just for Kark, I was beaver, man. If we, brought, if we brought Quinn on here, yeah, that would be a blood. <laughs> okay. You're safe. I love first, it. First question, Yorktown, Yorktown preseason pr- predictions. What do you think? What do you think? Well, you know, Timmy Schur, who's a great friend of mine, he was actually one of my coaches when I was in high school. Timmy played on the 2000 uh, World Championship Team USA team. And I think he was like 40-something years old when he was on that team. Uh, Defenseman, journeyman in club lacrosse. And he just came back to Yorktown after spending a bunch of years at John Jay. And he coached at Yorktown as an assistant for – probably 15, 20 years uh, during my era. So he's back. I think that he's given the program some life. But high school lacrosse has changed. I mean, you guys know. You all play public school lacrosse. It's yeah. it's tough sailing for these schools now, man. Like yeah. you played at Springfield. You were at MacArthur. But if MacArthur. you're from Ohio, what do you call it? MacArthur? MacArthur? MacArthur. You're from MacArthur. Yeah. So yeah. I'm from Yorktown. Danny, where'd you go to high school? Belmont Hill, baby. Come on. That's not that's not a public school, is it? No, no. it's not. It's a private school. No, of course not. No. Oh, the well, the, the two right. other guys understand what I'm saying. Like public yeah. school lacrosse was so so strong when we were growing up. There's been a major change, for better or for worse. Teams like Yorktown, it's really hard to compete at a conference when they play the Shamanades and the St. Anthony's of the world. When you're drawing kids from like club hotbed tight programs that are traveling 30, 40 minutes to private school to play. Yeah. Uh, so York, Yorktown's not what it used to be. And that's no slight at, at the current state of the program. It's just the reality. It's, yeah, it's the reality it, of lacrosse. I mean, it's you know, just kind of, I'm, it's, I'm in, it's kind of like a nasty beast right now. I coach at Calvert Hall and it's like, yeah, we're getting, we're getting kids that are not, you know, we're, we're getting them in, you know, we're getting them in from different States and everyone else is doing it. So it's like, yeah, if you don't do it, you're going to be caught. Yeah. As yes, long as, well, as, long well, as the well, Huskers yeah. win the Murph Cup, right? Right, Kark? As long as we get the Murph Cup, we're good to go. Yeah. yeah. If you don't win the Murph Cup, you have some issues. For those <laughs> who don't know what the Murph Cup is, uh, it's the annual battle with Lakeland. Uh, we know Rick Beardsley. He was a Lakeland yeah. alum. Uh, Yorktown and, and Lakeland are actually in the same town, uh, in, in the town of Yorktown. Yorktown Heights is where Yorktown High School is, but there's some hamlets uh uh, through, throughout the, the the greater Yorktown and, and Lakeland has to be uh, one of them. And there were some great battles in the past, that, but you know, you, you have to beat them. But just to put a bow on the whole private school thing, like I get it too. I was a public school guy my entire life. My dad taught in the South Bronx for 32 years. I have a daughter who's really into lacrosse, who's in seventh grade. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm like, I'm, I'm looking at some options for high school that aren't just public school. Right. Yeah. No, I, I, I actually love it because I, you know, I'm living in Maranek now, so I get to enjoy this whole section one thing. Yeah. Section one lacrosse is awesome. Yeah. And, you know, Yorktown actually lost a phenomenal faceoff guy last year who's going down to Connecticut College, Jason Fastigi. But we used to at Springfield, we used to lose guys to Haverford School in Malvern every year. Yeah. And it was yeah. infuriating. One of the reasons we moved up here out of the city, my wife and I, is because the public schools are so good. They're amazing. So yeah. It actually infuriates me when we lose someone, we, you know, we lose a kid to Iona Prep who wants to pay 50 grand a year to play at a team that's not as good. Sorry if you're at Iona right now, but you're not as good as Mamaronek. Yeah. So it's just interesting. Yeah. But what Clark, are you going to do, man? Yeah. 
Totally. But so I want to hear and bitch about it. That's what I do best. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to change the topic before I get any more private school shade because I went to <laughs> Belmont Hill. So, you know, Clark, we, we, you know, week zero or week one, whatever you want to call it, last week just happened. College across just got underway. I want to hear kind of your storyline for what you think this season is going to be. I feel like every season kind of has an overarching storyline. And then uh, second part of that question, talk to us a little bit about what game you're most excited to call this year. I think for starters, the storyline would be to me is like it was the Ivies in 2022 just uh, kind of just a one off year or is it a situation where we have to understand the Ivies are here to stay? And I think the Ivies are here to stay. You know, if you asked me a couple of years ago when COVID hit and the Ivy League wasn't playing lacrosse in 2020, like every other team had to cut their season short. And then 2021, they're the only league who's not playing. Like, if you asked me then, like, how is this league going to survive? But back to the whole situation with the way that lacrosse is kind of built, the Ivy League brands are here to stay. And I think they they weathered the hardest storm of them all, not playing in 2021 and being that only Division I conference. 100%. And they came out on top in 2022, and they were the best conference in college lacrosse last year. And I, and I think you could argue this year coming back, they are loaded as ever. I mean, you look at a team like Cornell and you could argue that a guy like Gavin Adler is the top defender in the country, along with Will Bowen, who plays at Georgetown. And they might have the best young star in college lacrosse and CJ Kirst. Princeton returns a, a ton of talent. They have two guys in the middle of the field um, that are as good as anyone. When you, when you think of, of English and Stevens, those guys are game tilters in terms of the way they play. They play like Zach Currier. Um, so I, I think, you, you know, you have all of these these teams and, and Yale with Matt Brandau, who will leave as the school's all-time leading scorer. And in the preseason, if you talk to some people, Leo Johnson's only a sophomore. He's right there with Matt Brandau. So I think the Ivies, I think, to me, had a major, major impact on college lacrosse in 2022 and they answered the bell, but I think they're here for, for to stay. And, you know, guys like, like beast and, and Scotty, you, you guys know a lot of the young talent. And when you see the best face off guys in the country and you see the best goalies in the country, the Ivies are on everyone's list. If you have the marks and you have the grades to entertain the opportunity to go to an Ivy league school, it's, it's really hard to turn down. And I think that these programs are, are, are definitely in the mix, maybe even more. So it might not be a, a six-team bid and come come tournament time, but I think it's a three to four top-heavy top ten type of, of of programs. When you think of the ones I mentioned, I didn't even mention Penn, who probably is the you know maybe the best player in the country, uh, and Sam Hanley too. So there's just so many storylines I think within the Ivy and the other the other the other piece to to me when I think of of, of this season is. It's just the way that that teams that are here and have been around for so long and have incredible coaches that they win differently. And I think Maryland's a, a perfect example of that. I think Maryland, we saw them win last year with offense, the Twarton winner and Logan Wisnowskis and the ball moved at hyper speed. And they maybe had the most prolific, you know, offense along with Penn State in, in 2019 in the last 20 years. I mean, Maryland statistically was ridiculous. I think John Tillman's such a good coach that I think we're going to see them win differently this year. They're going to dominate at the faceoff dot uh, with Luke Wehrman. Logan McNaney is one of the most underrated goalies you know you, you could ever really see. Kind of reminds me of, of Stetson Bennett in a way, other than yeah. the fact that he's not 25 years old. Like, <laughs> he does everything so well and maybe doesn't you know pass the eye test like some of these other prototypical, really super quick goalies or or guys that just are, are six foot three or or the quickest guys in the world. He's so patient. He's so good. And at the end of the day, he wins. He's had one bad game in his entire college career it was against Virginia in the national championship his, his freshman year. Other than that, he's been spectacular. Uh, so I think a guy like John Tillman will show you why he's one of the great coaches, yeah, of all time. I'm saying that because I think that he can win – differently. And I think Maryland's going to be a perfect example of that because they have such a great defense with Brett Maycar, Ajax Zapatello, and Logan McNaney. So I think that's a team that we, we just want to anoint another team just because they lost so much. They lost five of their top six scorers. But let's let's just sit back and, 
and give Maryland their respect. And they're the best team in the country until someone beats them. Yeah, Agreed. totally agree with you. And, and I want to go back to the Ivy League thing too, Kark. The 2020 recruiting class was the final class halfway through that recruiting cycle is when the IMLCA got together and the college coaches decided that they're going to move contact date to junior of a junior year, September 1. Yep. Before that, in the middle of that recruiting cycle and the years before it, we were getting eighth graders committing to colleges. Yes. It was an absolute nightmare. The biggest thing it did was hurt Ivies. And I remember Matt Madelon being like, when he was an assistant at Princeton, he's like, I can't, I can't get an eighth grader into here right now. No. Right. Like, no. We can't. Imagine going to admissions and asking yeah. someone at Princeton, can you get this eighth grader in? He hasn't started high school, but – can we give yeah. them a likely letter? They'll laugh at you. Dude, yeah. I had such a problem with that whole thing. Those kids don't even have hair on their balls yet. Like, yeah. I mean, I haven't done that check, <laughs> but I agree with you. And I think <laughs> I think that the September 1 decision gave the Ivies back their fighting power. Because you're right. When when we go – I mean, let's let's look at it back then. Eighth grader commits. Then he gets better. He commits. He recommits. You know, commitment is not a word anymore. But, you know – Kid picks three or four different schools before he graduated. It was a nightmare. So now the Ivies are actually – it's a fair playing field. And when it's a fair playing field, the Ivies have the, the advantage. Okay. Yeah, a- a- absolutely. I wasn't thinking the same angle as, as Scotty. When, when, when he mentioned the, the reason why you wouldn't re- recruit an eighth grader, I was like, no. My, my angle is no because these guys aren't proven. Like you don't know what this player right. looks like. When, when you think of recruiting – and you think of the journey of a, of a kid, don't you want to bank on someone that's at his or her closest age to playing against the competition that yeah. you are recruiting to play against? Yes. Right? So, like, when, when you have an eighth grader or a ninth grader, you don't know athletically how they're going to pop. Are, are they done growing? Are they, are, they, are, they, are they relying just on their physical attributes to dominate smaller Type yes. players, like, or are they skilled? And the, you know, you find these these kind of unicorns like Brennan O'Neill in eighth grade. I could have, yeah, we could all agree, Brennan O'Neill in eighth grade, be amazing. But that's like that, that's that's few and far between. But I, I I think what what you said, Beast, is is spot on because when when they slow down this calendar and then players started to progress and mature at a normal cycle. The school part of it also kind of flushed out and a kid could say to himself as a 16 year old, not a 14 year old, wow, I've done really well and I'm starting to grow up and understand that there's more to life maybe than just lacrosse and I'm going to have incredible options if I go to one of these Ivy League schools that I don't need to to jump the gun and commit to to, to a non-Ivy when I'm in when I'm in eighth grade, when my hands are tied too, because let's be honest. When you're a parent in the old recruiting ways, if someone says to you, we have an offer for your son or your daughter in eighth grade, and it's a top 15, 20 academic school in the country, and it also plays really high level lacrosse, you're not going to jump on that bird in hand. We took it every single time. Yeah. And they would decommit if somebody better came calling later. And yep. that's the system we were in. And it's funny you say that, Kark, with the whole like growth thing. Angelo Petrakis, when I was going to war trying to get him recruited as an eighth grader, Cornell at the time, we were on the phone and was like, I don't know. And the question was, how tall is his dad? And that's when I got off the phone. I looked at my wife. I'm like, this is ridiculous. Yeah, sir. And he committed to Lehigh. Then later when he, when he grew, Cornell took him. I saw Angelo Petrakis. Correct me if I'm wrong. He went to Massapequa, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. I go. saw Angelo Petrakis play Fairfield Prep. I think it was his junior or senior year. And he was a wrestler in high school too, wasn't he? Oh, yeah. Good one too. Hey, you want that kid on your team. Oh, like, yeah. just, he's just built differently, this right? Is just a good Tough kid, Long man. Island kid, right? I'm, I'm speaking the language with Scotty. Tough <laughs> Long Island kid who's a wrestler and a face-off guy. Like, and he goes to Massapequa. Like, eh, yeah. I, I think he has the head to take care of <laughs> He's a total right? home run. Yeah. Clark, now, speaking of speaking of you know prolific recruits, I'd love to kind of get your take on you know we just saw last weekend the emergence of the new twenty two at Syracuse. They had a you know a hard fought win against a very improved UVM team, a uh, UVM team that you know has had some success in the American East tournament as of late and making the NCAA tournament. What's this outlook on the Syracuse season? You think, in your opinion, as an alumni, with this new kind of Gary Gate era? 
Are you asking me about the Gary Gator or you want me to comment on Joey Spelina's? <laughs> no. Movie? So yeah. I I mean, Clark, I I saw the tweets oh, and this- people freaking out about his, you know, shooting yeah. percentage. And I I'm totally against that. You know, he's a freshman. He was gripping the stick a little tight, probably. If that first one falls, he's scoring four or five goals that game. He was yes, generating absolutely. great looks. Do you, know how much, do you know how much pressure that kid's under? Totally. Yes, I'm, I'm asking wholeheartedly as an alumni. Yeah. Well, I'm going to talk about Spelina as well. And, and I think Gary Gate handled it perfectly in the press conference. I watched the entire press conference. And, and he mentioned, you know, this is Joey's first game along with the other freshmen. And, you know, when you're a freshman – and you step into your first game where number 22 and you're playing in the dome, the expectations are super, super high. I think this was actually the, the perfect scenario for Joey. People have to understand something about Joey. And and Greg knows really well because he played for, for Joey's dad. No one loves lacrosse more than that kid. No one's going to work harder than that kid. No one's going to, to care as much as that kid. He will fix this. He will take care of it. And he will get the last laugh. So the the one for 15 is probably a good thing for him as a freshman because now like he always has that ca- that carrot dangling in front of him because he hears doubters from from day one. Some of these people who saw him shoot for one for 15, that will be in the back of their head for the rest of the year. Be like, oh, Spelina can't shoot. He can't do this. That he can't do that. He's going to be absolutely fine. I will say this. I watched them practice in the fall, and the ball was moving at a crazy, crazy pace. I think they got away from that. And Joey will be at his best when the ball is moving really, really fast and he can dodge off a ball movement. He can dodge off of poor approaches. He can get involved as a feeder because he's a tremendous passer. He had more assists in high school than he had goals. That's the part that we didn't see enough from him. Because I think when you're a freshman attackman and you're not shooting well in the beginning of the game, you want to get off of that kind of... That, that schneid, right? You want to start scoring goals. So you push a little bit more and then you take away some of your best qualities, which are passing, distributing, and getting everyone else involved. So he's going to be fine. I think Gary Gate is an incredible lacrosse mind. And I think he's going to get the last laugh because a lot of people were laughing at him last year. Let's be honest. They saw him on the sideline and they see Petro doing a lot of, a lot of the coaching. They see Gary chilling out back and they're like, what's he doing? Gary Gate's soaking all of this in. He's the greatest player of all time. But if you w- look at his, his resume as a coach, amazing. When he was at Maryland coaching the women's, they won seven national titles. Look at the coaches who come from that tree. Uh, Kelly Amante Hiller played for Gary Gate at Maryland. Jen Adams played for Gary Gate at Maryland. Yeah. Kathy Reese played for Gary Gate at Maryland. Acacia Walker played for Gary Gate at Maryland. He also coached the 2006 gold medal Canadian national team that beat the Americans um, up in Canada. He also scored like seven or eight goals and was the co-coach in that. He's won major indoor championships as a professional coach. He's won major outdoor championships as a professional coach. Like if we want to doubt this guy, go ahead. He's soaking it all in. He understands exactly what his steps and his procedures are going to be. He knows the type of player he wants playing in his offense. He parachuted in, and that team he inherited was the team that he inherited. Those aren't the guys that he recruited. Take this into account, too. Who was the most impressive freshman people saw last week? Was it Finn Thompson? Maybe. Okay. Probably. Who got Finn Thompson? Or the goalie. He got Finn Thompson from Michigan. He was a Michigan commit when Gary Gay got the job. Within two months, Finn Thompson flipped to him. He's going to get plenty of those players. If you're a Canadian and they're the best scorers in lacrosse, who wouldn't want to play for Gary Gate? He's the Michael Jordan of the sport, and he happens to be from your country, and he also revolutionized the game of lacrosse. Like lacrosse, I always tell people this. Lacrosse never, okay, looked the same after Gary Gate picked up a stick because you turn on a tape and you watch college lacrosse in 1986, (laughs) and you turn on a tape and watch it four years later, his senior year in college, it's not even the same game. Absolutely. And as a result of Gary Gate, there were the Powell brothers. As a result of the Powell brothers, there were the Thompsons. And now you have all these kids in their backyard throwing these one-handed passes. You're behind the backs, through the legs, all the creativity's off the charts. Gary Gate is the reason for that. I know there was unbelievable players before Gary Gate and some of the greatest players ever, and you have to kind of measure off of the, the era you played in. But the game was never the same after he played. Yeah, hundred percent agree with everything you just said, Kark. And, and also, you know, we know about lacrosse Twitter. 
The loudest voices are usually a bunch of NARPs who they that don't even have names. They don't have names or they don't have faces, you know, all right across Twitter, love to chime in on shit. But what people don't understand about Joey Spolina is the typical freshman put in this situation would be reading the articles, would be checking Twitter, would be really upset he didn't score more. Joey Spolina is probably sitting there watching the film going, okay. I'm not going to make that mistake again. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to do this instead differently. I'm going to sit in with coach and I'm going to talk about what I need to do practice-wise. He, It's just another learning experience for this kid because he has all the confidence in the world. And the reason he has the confidence in the world and it's not arrogance, the difference between confidence and arrogance is confidence means I'm going to be great because I'm going to outwork everyone and I'm going to make sure I'm great. Whereas arrogance, you just believe that you're better than people. Right. And Joey Spelina absolutely is filled with confidence for a good reason. I mean, the kid worked harder at Lizard's practices when he was eight than we did. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Yeah, it, and I agree. We talk about confidence and we talk about, like, how you're going to respond to adversity. Everybody that's in this this little chat right now on this podcast deals with it on a daily basis. I mean, Scotty, how often do you get chirped on Twitter? Peace, Dude. how often do you get chirped on Twitter? Yeah. Danny, I'm sure you get ch- chirped on Twitter. The I bottom mean, I'm line still is, get dunked on by my boss at work. Yes, <laughs> we all we all we all fear it. we all feel it, and we all read it, and we all kind of take it in for what it's worth. But at the end of the day, if you know that you love what you do, and you put forth a crazy amount of effort, and you're a really really good person, eventually you get to a point where all of the noise. Is just noise. Yeah, it doesn't you, affect you at all. Yeah, noise affects you when you don't prepare for what you what you're involved with. Okay, noise prepares for you when you doubt yourself. But when you prepare and you love what you do and you put forth a great effort, like in my case, I get chirped at. People probably turn on the television sometimes and say, "Oh, what's he talking about? What a tool he is." I don't really care because a, I know I go into every single game, every single assignment with a hundred percent effort. That's number one. Number two is I'm really, really prepared. So I know that I put in the time, I put in the effort. So the way that I'm seeing things, I'm confident in the way that I'm breaking it down. And then the third thing is I love the sport and I always put the sport before me. So if I could put the sport before me every single time that I step in front of a camera, I'm good. I'm good. And not everyone's going to agree with me and I'm okay with that. Love that, Kark. And, and, and speaking of that, is there any way we can get the head of officials – to also put the sport first. Is there any are you, way? Are you, ta- are you talking about the way that the, the, the face-off is, is official? It's an absolute of disaster. Of course. You don't have to answer this, Kark. <laughs> don't answer it. It's, well, look, it, ba- baby steps. They are stationary, right? It's, been, it's better than it was in the past. No, it's never been worse than this. It's really? It's never been worse. This is, this is the worst it's been since 1999. Wow. It's, Explain to me I why. think I so, think the only solution so, is to get Greg some zebra stripes and put them out there. I would <laughs> crush it. Um, but so in 2015, when we had the physical set call, okay, set call, the kids would stop moving. You'd back out two or three steps, blow the whistle. Kids were reacting to a whistle and you knew every single time they were set up correctly. It was fair. What they've done now is they've turned down the Madden sliders So the kids who have better reaction are actually totally guessing. Every kid, I had, my inbox was flooded on Monday. Guys were coming off the field going, so we're we're going on the T of set. So I experienced this in the MLL for years and in international play. Every kid is guessing. And it's, that's what's happened in the PLL as well. Everyone's just going to guess. So you line up, the refs are on an angle. They're not even straight behind you. So they can't really be lined up correctly. Yeah. And every kid's telling me, they're like, yeah, we're, we're slightly leaning unless they tell me not and to. they're pretty far away, so they don't even – they can't even <laughs> they can't really – can't see shit. Play. Yeah. They can't see shit. And they're, they're blowing the whistle so fast after they say set that kids are all jumping like crazy. The first Navy game, there were seven procedure calls in the first half. It – it is no, a if you watch mess. the Navy or a Maryland game, though, I don't know how you could tell anything. That 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 camera at it's on the moon. Bird <laughs> Stadium, College Park is shot. It's shot from Mars and Navy too. Can we please that. bring down the cameras? Is well, the really refs hard? like that because you can't like, tell oh, if they're leaning or football not. Stadium. No, watch a game at Syracuse. It's shot really well. Yeah, no, but but that's my thing with the with the way they're doing it right now. 
is it's just all guessing. So what you're going to do is the Weirmans of the world, the Petey LaSalle's of the world are going to be severely negatively affected by this because wow. you're going to have other guys come in and they're just going to guess on the whistle and have a yeah. chance. Rather than it just be who's the better face-off guy. Who's the better face-off Scotty, guy. I want to ask you about, about the dive because there's a change in that rule now where I, I thought – I thought the advantage was to the defense in the past because regardless, if you ever if you ever landed in the goal mouth, whether it was defensive pressure, no pressure, it was never a goal. But now they've kind of taken that advantage away from the defense. So if the defender pushes me or the pressure forces me to go into the goal mouth and I score and the ball crosses the plane before I land, it's a goal. Um, I, I always like to hear goalies' opinions. I mean, no one had the dive against him or in college lacrosse and my brother Brian. He played against Mike Watson, Doug Knight, Casey yeah. Powell, Ryan Power. He every single game the dive the was missiles. right in front of his face. And if you asked him, he loved the dive. He thought it was great part of lacrosse. Like what what's your take Scotty on it? Scotty loves the dive too, because they decapitate. So, so my whole thing with that is like, if you're gonna do that, I'm gonna do something. Right. So like you're gonna come in my home, yeah. I'm gonna probably body slam you. You won't do it again. So the first time you get an N one, great. Next time you're gonna think I'm Scotty's gonna get Scotty's coming, so that's how I always did it. That's like yeah. even even at Notre Dame, I always took that hit. I was like, Coach, I'm taking the penalty. If I get the penalty, I'm protecting myself. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I, I honestly think what we need is a third. We need a third crease. <laughs> oh God! Why? Are oh, you joking? He's, He's joking. <laughs> no, I've actually tell me, about, Kark. I've had this idea about. Allowing diving in any way, shape, or form, but make the crease a little bigger. Yeah, I, I just think you should be able to dive, and we should do it like in the past. If the ball crosses the plane, okay, if the ball crosses the plane before you land in the crease, it's a goal. If you're pushed, you're pushed. Like the whole idea, like how many goalies have we ever seen injured because of the dive? Like in Major League Lacrosse, how many goalies were, were injured I mean, when you played? I can tell you guys were not happy. Like Mundorf was like 200 pounds diving at your knees. So, I mean. Yeah, yeah. Drew Adams wasn't happy either. But you're hurt, right. I've never hurt, seen though, that goalie no. actually get like hurt. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I also think if a – to your point, Scotty, if there is a player who is diving, I, I think – I, I think he's he's live. He's part of the action. Oh, the only thing though goal. with that dive is if the guy dives in your crease and your knees are like, and you like lock your knees and your butts out, you're getting your knees are getting taken out. Yeah, and I understand the you know the, yeah. the whole, all the protocols towards safety, and I and I agree with it. I, I think this is a good step because I thought it was a joke in the past. Like if you're a defender, just just throw the kid yeah. in, and it'll never no, be. I, a goal. I like it too. I, I think it's going in the right direction for sure. I agree with you, Kark. But just switching gears a little bit, why don't you tell us a little bit how you got into the broadcasting business? You know, I'm sure all the lacrosse fans out there are aware that you're, you know, doing the games with ESPN, but you've recently been doing football a lot. I see you on Saturdays in the fall. I love checking in and uh, seeing your face. But yeah, tell us how you got into it. Well, this has actually been my, this is my 10th year of college football. I've been calling college lacrosse since 2004. It was, honestly, it was like a mistake. It just, just kind of happened. I went to Syracuse. I did not belong to the Newhouse School of Communications, which is one of the best in the country for, for broadcasters. I was a poli-sci major. I, to be honest, I majored in lacrosse. I just wanted to go to, to Syracuse. I wanted to play for Coach Roy Simmons Jr. I wanted to compete for national championships, and that's why I went to Syracuse. Um, when I was there, I developed a lot of great relationships with, with some people. And there was a, a gentleman who was, uh, you know, you know, one of my contemporaries and he, he was at the new house school. And when he was at CSTV, which is CBS sports. Now there was an opening for one game in 2004. It was, it was Navy against army. Um, and at that point in time, like I, 1997, when I graduated from Syracuse, there was no MLL and there was no real life after lacrosse other than going to some some tournaments like Lake Placid and, and, and Vail. And I felt a, a major void in, in my life, to be honest with you, because I just I just missed the locker room. I missed the adrenaline rush. So I got a phone call. I was I was teaching and I was coaching um, in 2004. I was an elementary school teacher. I was coaching varsity lacrosse at Fox Lane in Bedford, New York. I got a call uh, from someone asking me like, hey, do you want to you want to try calling this game? We're, we're kind of in a pinch. I was like, yeah, I'll give it a I'll give it a whirl. I did it. I had no clue. No one told me anything about the profession, how to call a game. I went in there, 
totally cold, uh, clueless. But I just remember like probably midway through the second quarter, it was an Army Navy game. I'm like, wow, like this is this is like adrenaline. Like this is this is kind of what I was missing. So it was the only game I did that year, 2005. Uh, ESPN had a full slate of games on their network. So Quint uh, left CSTV and was calling games for CSTV as well. So there was a void. And Joe Beninati was was the play-by-play, and they were looking for a full-time analyst. They brought like six or seven guys in for uh, for 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 the for an interview and and, and kind of just see what you were able to do. And I went on the audition. I got the job. I did a full season, and I will tell you. Joe Beninati was the best person for a first-time broadcaster to do a game because the the professionalism that he had, the way that he prepared, it's the only thing that I thought it was the way to do it. Like, I just thought that was par for the course. Meanwhile, I've been in the industry for a long time now, almost 20 years, and I realized, like, he is the ultimate preparer. But he was the best person. It was a gift uh, for, for, for me to be with him that year. Because he set like the standard of, of the way to approach a game and, and the way to do research and the way to ask questions. And I just remember like in 2005, I did that full season. I'm like, I, I love this so much. And for the next few years, I was doing um, college lacrosse commentating. I was coaching high school lacrosse. I was a school teacher. I remember my younger brother, Brian, said to me, he's like, you know what, man, I think you're pretty good at this. But the only way you're really going to be good. And normally you don't listen to your younger brother. He's like. If you quit teaching and you put all of your eggs in one basket and you, and you roll and you see how it goes. I was like, quit teaching, dude. 25 years, I'm going to have a pension. Dad's a teacher. He's retiring. I told my dad, like, he he almost, like, he almost lost his mind. You're going to leave teacher in Bedford, New York. It's one of the best districts to be in. Like, you're going to have an incredible, an incredible last leg of your life. And I remember my brother, Brian, who's in commercial real estate at the time, and he still is. And he's a pretty smart businessman. He's like, don't listen to dad. He's like... You're actually losing money um, by by teaching and trying to do do both because your your headspace isn't there and you're not able to fully commit. So I just remember like I went on a one year leave and I never went back. And during that one year, I wasn't guaranteed anything. So in 2010, I went over to ESPN and I remember in 2011, I took the leave and I never went back. Um, and during that year, I fully immersed myself Monday through Friday. I was doing research. I was learning more about players. I was learning more about storylines. And within all of that, too, I, I found a real love for telling stories. As much as I love calling college lacrosse um, and college football, it's the stories of the players that really, really drive me. So I started doing a lot of different little features on players, some of my relaxing stuff, which were driving in cars and filming it myself to to, to doing haircuts in, in certain locker rooms, to the to the virtual relaxings that I do right now, to the podcast that I've done. Like the storytelling has really driven me as a broadcaster to want to do more and more. So in 2011, when I was on that leave, I just fully immersed myself. And within a year, they offered me to do college football. And from 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 there on, it's been it's been my life. And it's 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 been an incredible opportunity for me. Uh it's it's wonderful. It's challenging from from a travel standpoint. I mean, I fly 125,000 miles a year. Like I, I'm not home a lot during the week, weekends when my kids are are off, and that that's a huge, huge challenge for me. But I'm also there and picking them up from school on a on a Tuesday, you know, and I'm the only parent that's doing that sometimes too. So like I can I can find ways to to fill gaps. I'm in the cars with with my kids on all their after school activities, and I have a 15 year old son, Grayson. Uh, he's autistic, and he's been one of the the greatest gifts to me too because I, I have a different perspective in life. I do not sweat the small stuff, and he's the gift that that allowed me not to sweat the small stuff. Like I don't I don't worry like with some parents are like, oh geez, I hope he gets recruited or this that and the other thing. I just want Grayson to be happy because I know he's not going to Syracuse to play lacrosse or he's going to Virginia. And I'm not trying to get him in this showcase or that showcase. He's just going to be part of our family. He's taught us so much and he's been a gift for me, my wife, my, my daughter, Payla, who's 12, who loves lacrosse, who's really into it. She's the way she is too, because of him. So it allows me to be with him in, in certain times and moments um, that a lot of dads and moms can't uh, because of their flexibility. Um, I lose flexibility on the weekends, but I gain it during the week. And um, 
<laughs> yeah, it's just my it's life, life, man. I'm sorry yeah. for that long-winded answer. Oh, no, no, look, man, it was a journey. I love it that. was a journey. That's why it was a long-winded answer. <clears throat> I remember you – I mean, you did the MLL games too. You crushed it. Yeah, I loved it, man. Like, I – I, you know, when I call these games, I, I – I know this sounds bizarre, but, like, I, I almost get in, like, a trance. Like, if I really try to – to think about the way I'm going to call a game, I'm going to get nervous. Like I'm going to be like, "Oh my gosh!" Like, what? It, what am I going to do in this moment? That moment, I literally let my instincts take over, and I just, I just go with it. I just, dude, I, I had the joy of calling the, um, the one game between Albany, the, the tournament game between Albany and Denver with you. I was on the field, kind yeah. of doing the face-off stuff. And yo, man, you're, you're, you're guy. in the zone. It's awesome. You might as well have iBlack on out there. You I, I are love so it, dialed in, dude. It's it's so cool. Yeah, it's amazing. Look, and I, and I think lacrosse. I tell people all the time, and I, I've covered. I think pretty much in the last last eleven years doing college football, I think I've covered almost every single Power Five program of the big conferences. I've called every single every single team um, over that span. But I will tell you, and I people think I'm crazy. If you give me an opportunity to call like an Alabama football game or call an insane lacrosse game, I'm picking an insane lacrosse Still game up, every yeah. single time. It's just it's yeah. in my DNA. It's in my blood. You know, the pageantry of college football is incredible, and the fan bases are are nuts. That's why, like, when they when they cart me off one day, I, I hope that I say it to nauseam enough where we could just play all our lacrosse games in these smaller venues, make them feel, make them feel like rock concerts because there are some, Scotty, you're Irish, man. You go to Arlotta. That place, is, that place. Is, is juiced. Happy Valley, dude. Panzer's nuts. Pan, no. What do they call it? Panzamonium? Or, Panzamonium. Yeah. yeah. That place is great. It's perfect for college lacrosse. You know, you, you have these, the, these venues, Ohio State now, they built a stadium that fits like 2,500, 3,000. Doesn't seem a lot. But when 4,000 people show up there, it's going to feel like something special. So much better than being in the shoe. Denver, so the worst thing you can do to try to, for all of us to sell a sport is to come on the air and do an Ohio State football, I mean, lacrosse game in the football stadium with football lines with no one there. So yeah. if you're a casual sports fan, what, what is the intrigue to stay on that? 100%. People There's used enough. to ask me at Penn State, you're like, you ever play in Beaver Stadium? I'm like, no, that would have been a nightmare. <laughs> Awful. So it'd be like, be like 20 guys' up, parents in 110,000. Off, this, is, this is what I want my legacy to be. Like, no more football stadiums, no more football lines to the point where I had a guy at ESPN, really smart guy, was a Syracuse grad. He's been in, he's been a uh, coordinating producer for a long time. He's, he's, he's a genius. Um, and he told me, he's like, is Syracuse a lacrosse school? And he knew it was because right. he follows lacrosse and loves it. He's like, I don't, I don't. I disagree. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, why do you play on a football field? I'm like, ooh, like, good point. He actually sent me, he superimposed what the dome would look like if you took out all the football lines and it was just a lacrosse field. So it means a ton to me to the point where I love Albany for the PLL, but Albany plays on a football field for the PLL. Like the PLL should never really play on a football field, right? We are a lacrosse sport. We're not football okay we need to play on lacrosse lines only right like to me that is huge we got to get out of the football stadiums and we need to have fields that are only lacrosse lines that's, that's what, what, he wants. Wants. He card what he wants what's that and you give me the refs that i want yeah we finally get the sport perfect. that don't we don't you deserve. think that's a different like scotty when you when you parachute in on a game and you see a game and there's only lacrosse lines and it's in a small venue and you see people everywhere isn't that a different viewing experience than if you were to to watch Michigan play in the big house? And Michigan doesn't play in the yeah, big so house. Yeah, so dude, like I or love Maryland. That. Everyone, everyone says, okay, they've changed the name of that stadium ten times already. I get right. it. It was, it was Bird Stadium, then it was Capital One. I don't even know what they call it right now. But at the end of the day, and I know a lot of Maryland alum are gonna be like, oh, whatever, Clark, whatever. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm not. I'm not in love with that. That Shady venue. lacrosse field, man. The yeah, crown on that field is empties. from 1952. I think yeah. Denver, the crown on that field Denver's goes like this. Denver's the Denver's best. Denver's amazing. Denver is the best. PLL went out to Denver. We were doing a game on a Friday night. Oh, Peter Barton Stadium. It was mm-hmm. unbelievable. Mm-hmm. We, we had the drones shooting over it. It was it was it was amazing. 
It's the same thing with the Final Four. Like, why are we playing? Why are we playing at these massive football stadiums? Because 2009, when there was 50,000 people, people don't understand. Lacrosse was in a totally different spot. I, I think in 2009, which a fraction of the amount of, of kids were playing club lacrosse. Now, every kid's playing club lacrosse. Mom and dad look at their summer schedule and they're like, geez, we're traveling for, uh, oh boy, eight straight weeks. Yeah. We're not going to the Final Four. On Memorial Final Day weekend, weekend, but nonetheless. Yes. Yeah. The like Final Four used to be a destination where families, it was one of their few lacrosse weekends of, of the year. The game's changed. Like the travel lacrosse has, has put the sport in a position where families have only so much discretionary income. They only have so much time. Are they going to go to the Final Four when they're when they're staring down six to eight straight weekends on the road? Agreed, Kark. And also the other thing, too, I was talking about this with someone this week. We were talking about LaxCon and how LaxCon is kind of in trouble. And, yeah. you know, someone was asking, why is the attendance drop? I'm like, look, it used to be you had to go to LaxCon to get, a, like, elite advice from coaches and to understand the sport and rub elbows with people. Now – I have 400 free videos on my YouTube channel of Face Off. Yeah. Yeah. You can get your information anywhere now. Exactly. So no, it's like, you, to go to you know, it's not – the sport has gotten so accessible. Some will argue sometimes pros are too accessible that kids get jaded where the Final Four used to be where you you had to see lacrosse in person. Um, I agree with you. The smaller venues – when we play the PLL Championship in Philly, well, Chester – and it's just PLL lines, and it's a championship game. It looks unbelievable. It looks, yeah, it looks unreal. Uh, unbelievable. Un- unbelievable. Like, look at it visually. Look at look at that as opposed to when it's played with with with, with football lines. And to your point too, Greg, I always would say too when I was calling your Lizards games back in the day, the pros are so accessible. Like, who's going to want to watch John Gagliardi? Play for the lizards when you could sit down next to him at Gino's Pizza and see him smash that. <laughs> right? I was telling my wife, I said, you know, I ruined any ability to have my autograph worth anything because I used to sign five thousand autographs after every Lizards game. Yeah. But you know, speaking of lines, I want to get you on this one. I got one question before we call tonight here. Is it is it gambling thing? No, I'm okay. locked in right now. I, I want to just tell you guys, I don't gamble ever. And I don't get involved in lines because my grandfather was a degenerate, deadbeat gambler. And he scarred my entire family. I can laugh about it now because it's we, we joke about it. But my grandfather, Danny Carcaterra, his real name was Aniello, was the biggest deadbeat, degenerate gambler. And he, and he put my dad and my grandma and my aunt through the ringer, dude. Every month was like, are we making our bills? They lived in the projects in the Bronx. So I'm scarred from gambling. I understand I that. You. I understand I, that. I think he was just one good bet away. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That's a great, That's great thing to put out there. Just one I more. agree. It's easier to be a degenerate than ever. I have a. I keep myself on a very short leash. I couldn't I'm imagine about if my grandfather was alive now with the accessibility. Like, oh my like god! Draft, yeah. Like DraftKings. Yeah. Oh my Ooh. god! Yeah. But I wanted to ask you about. Do you think there will ever be a two-point line in college across? Jeez. I, I I wish I wish there was. Like why why don't we have a two-pointer? I can tell you. I I, I, I think that I love the PLL rules. There's only one there's only one rule or one kind of configuration that I would change. The shortened field, I think the the initial reaction to the shortened field is you're gonna get a lot more action and you're gonna get a lot more up and down. I think it's actually prohibited fast breaks because guys get in the hole so easily now. So I, I love every PLL rule other than the size of the field. So if the size of the field is regulation in terms of of, of the, the college game and where the college game is and how long the field is and you take every PLL rule, I, I'm, I'm good with it. Like, yeah. I'm good with it. I think I, the I PLL think the, rules are amazing. The- the PLL rules, and I played in a, I played international, college, high school, MLL, PLL. PLL rules are by far the most fun I've ever had playing. Yeah, the, the only thing about the PLL too, outside of the length of the field, the game I have too much fun, and the games are too short. I want the games longer because I want more yeah, lacrosse. Short, yeah, yeah. Back well, to the, I, I think, the marathons of the MLL games. Oh, those oh, really dude, out. You know, I'm, I'm, I have PTSD from from oh, MLL games. Trust me, and, and I. Beast I'm like, I'm like, we have a, a weather delay. 
We have a, a wedding TV delay time. in Long Island. A TV timeout with three people in the stands. I'm like, let's keep it rolling. <laughs> no, Sixteen the PLO, games. The PLO and they were each doing because four hours long. You you want live sports other than the NFL and football? Like football's its own beast. Football every year rates more and more and more. This country's absolutely crazy for football. Other than that, you have to be in a two hour window, and yeah. and that's why they play it at that length. The PLO, I now, like I said, every rule. I wish college played the PLO rules outside of I just want the field a little bit longer because you, you think about it like you don't see a lot of traditional fast breaks in the PLL. Yeah, I think I love the size of the PLL field. I could see maybe instead of taking 10 yards out of the middle field, you take five yards out. I liked the shorter field playing wise. From a face-off standpoint, it made it easier to game plan because the wings are closer too. Yeah. Yeah. So you can make it was more of a three on three face off. But the reason we don't have two point arcs, same reason it took us 80 years to get an, a shot clock, is you know, the traditionalists, the old heads, they don't wanna they don't wanna let go. Yeah, they don't and, and here here's the kicker in all that too. It's like, you know, oh why is it so bad if, if someone comes up with a great idea that's not yours, right? Like, <laughs> like, the, like the PLL and pro lacrosse has this two point line. Just, just, just suck it yeah. up and say, that's the way it should be played. hundred percent. You could feel that, right? Kark, it was palpable when the ML came out with their rules. You could feel the NCAA was like, yeah, we're, we're not going to do that. However, on the college and the women's side, they'll have one, one championship game. They're like, man, we could probably use a shot clock. Boom, 48 hours later, shot clock. The game, the women's game went from watching one of those games in like 2014, 15, I don't know the exact year, when a team had a lead down the stretch, it it, it almost became unwatchable because it was like keep away. Yeah. And then when they got the shot clock before the men's game, amazing. The women's game is lacrosse at its purest form. If you watch women's lacrosse, like a midfielder is a true midfielder. Yeah. Like in, in the skill level, the athleticism, you know, my daughter loves loves women's lacrosse, who so we watch a lot. I am I am all in on, on women's lacrosse. I, and when, I couldn't, when they I made couldn't agree switch, more. Yeah, totally. when they I made the switch, more. when Sorry. they made the switch, it took it to a completely different level. Because you watched a really exciting game for what would be three quarters. They played halves. Now they're right. playing quarters, but the, back then they were playing halves. For three quarters, and then the game just really just went to a, a, a halt, and they they made they made the adjustments. Well, that was the biggest thing I noticed. My first couple games of my MLL career in 2006. I remember in college, if you were up by three goals with like five minutes left, it, it was, was a wrap. It was a wrap. Yeah, yeah. you know, you just hold the ball forever. In the in the MLL or the PLL, you're up by six goals with like a couple minutes left, and you're sweating. It's yes. three because you're literally three shots away from being tied. Right. It's crazy. Yeah. And you also, you know what you also do when you have a, a two-point line? You you give the younger generation, the defenders, more of a reason to have better stick skills. So mm. even if even if these kids never shoot a two-pointer, they're going to have so much better stick skills. Like if they don't shoot a two-pointer yeah. in college, they're going to be playing a certain way. And I also, the one last thing I'd like to say on the rules is we just need universal rules. Like, everyone should be playing the same exact rules. Don't tell me, like, oh, shot clocks cost money. Every basketball gym in America has a shot clock. Let's be <laughs> honest. But we need universal rules across the board. And if you have that, you are going to have such a cleaner lacrosse sport in terms of the stick skills and the proficiency in terms of the way defenders handle the ball. Because they well, I talked about carrots before. You're going to wave a carrot in front of a young defender's face and say, you have an opportunity to play offense. So he or she's going to play with, with way more, with, with way more, uh, you know, ability to, to drive, to have great stick skills. Right. Yeah. 100%. And, and then you're going to have to figure out too, like, do you, do you ever put an extra two point line, you know, in, in the women's game too, because I, the, the issue there is oh, they could shoot the last they years shoot hard. the ball so hard, yeah. so hard. You watch like, you know, the Charlotte Norths of the world and, and, and some of these women, they shoot the ball so hard and the traditionalists never want a helmet. I'm not even so concerned about like the actual shot. What worries me sometimes is like the ball, like if Charlotte North's shooting 90 miles an hour and the ball hits a pipe and it goes off and, and hits someone like <laughs> that, that's that's where my head goes. With, with, that's why I'm a proud non-traditionalist. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, Clark, this has been a blast. We don't want to keep you all night. I'm sure we all of us, we could talk to you for, for hours. But I guess, you know, just to end it, uh, you mentioned uh, in your past, you've talked about your relaxing with Clarks and your haircuts. Is there anything planned uh, upcoming for this season that we should be excited for? Is Will there be a rematch with uh, Coach Corrigan in the cook-off? Uh, that, that thing was rigged, by the way. He cooks. He actually cooks good Italian, though. He, he does. And I didn't know, to his defense, his mom's like 100% yeah. Italian. Yeah. And he has some good recipe. I, I thought he was like, I thought he, I know. you know, he, he was born a leprechaun. You know what I mean? I thought he was like from, from Dublin or something. Like, when he told me he wanted to have a cook-off, I mean, is this guy serious? Like, Dude, he's kind of I'm going to lap him. He's I'm really confident him. in his sauce. Yeah, so he rolls in and dude, like I went to South Bend, I smashed and traveled with my own garlic. I like I didn't I didn't joke <laughs> around and wasn't going to tops to buy my right, uh, right. stuff. You know what I mean? I had my spices, I had everything. Oh, shit. And we have this cook off and he rolls in and I knew he was for real too because he had San Marziano tomatoes, right? Like so right That's off like the bat, I'm like, yeah, yeah. Well, all right, well he's got the right tomatoes. Maybe he just maybe he's this guy's not a joke. He's got the right and gravy. To, yeah, and to his defense. Dude, he he brought the he brought the the heat and he did an amazing job and I really really liked his food. But and I'll send you guys I'll send you guys a, a clip of, of Chris Cotter kissing his butt and, and giving him the nod. So there the, the the voting panel was Chris Cotter, uh, Mike Golick Jr. and uh, Brian Costabile's dad. I think his name's Armand. Yes. And okay, so here's the deal. Chris Cotter was was kissing Corgan's rear end because he was calling the games. He wanted to get on his good side. And like yep. Cotter, Cotter didn't know if really Corgan really, really warmed up to him. So if, if you see this clip too, he's like, well, these, you know, these meatballs are very good, but coach <laughs> Coach Corgan's uh lazy man's lasagna, I'm gonna have to give it the edge. And like he was he was it was so pathetic. And goal of course being from Notre Dame. Yep. <laughs> Armand Costabile, the true Italian of the bunch, whose son was a captain on the team, he gave me the nod. That's, the only that's, all one that, I that's really actually did. that's all that matters. It's that's all, all that matters. So for the TV, it was made for TV. Give this guy, this Irish guy, the the nod. Go ahead. I don't care. <laughs> At the end of the day, Costabile's dad, he 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 gave me the nod. I we're would have to have a rematch. Off of him. You know, we're going to be doing some other stuff this year. I'm going to continue doing the relaxing, but I I I, I was able to join some. Some heads together with 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 people to to start a little segment called "What's Good," and we're just going to celebrate something that's good in the sport. We're going to come back from a break and tell like a quick forty five second story about something that's great in the sport, and it has nothing to do with anyone who's playing on the field at that time. It's going to be the men's and the women's game, so there could be a women's story that's being you know the what's good in a men's game. Like for example, the two that I already started. Uh, do you know who Max Maniac is Scotty from? Uh, from Notre Dame, he's a captain. He doesn't play much, but he was voted captain. This kid is one of the most amazing young men you can find. Everyone absolutely loves him. I don't think he's really played any significant minutes in his career. He's a, he's a diehard domer. Diehard. He's a diehard. Like he, okay. yeah, he embodies that whole thing. So, not not to be long winded, and you guys are probably like, "Oh my god, this guy's been talking no, forever." Dude, that's why I tell you not this, at all. You got the time. Story, you can stay. In 2020, Max was part of a group. Uh, where he would visit the hospital in South Bend with some of these, you know, terminally ill young cancer patients. And then COVID kicks in and he can't see these kids anymore. So that's when he started uh, this nonprofit called Pediatric Pep Talk. So now he started this app and all these athletes, and it's become nationwide too. He's got schools from, from other parts of the country, hospitals joining in, where athletes can capture a relationship with a young cancer patient or another patient um, that's in a hospital that's not doing so well, and they become buddies with these athletes. Like a, like a mentor? A pep talk. What's like, that? Like a mentor program. Yeah, a mentor yeah, this program. Is so cool. at business, and you, you develop this relationship uh, amongst the student athlete and – uh, you know, the patient in the hospital and it, and it gives them hope. And, you know, they've had like 2,400 smiles in this last year because of this. And the number is going to go up and up and up. This what's good thing that I'm talking about has nothing to do with how many goals you're scoring or Brendan O'Neill being the fastest to score 100 at Duke. It's about like, what are these young men and women doing off the field in lacrosse that we could be proud about? Because lacrosse sometimes gets a bad rap, let's be honest. Yep. But there's also so many amazing young men and so many amazing young women we're doing 
awesome stuff that should be celebrated. Another one that I just finished, uh, Margaret Williams is from, from Army West Point. She plays for Michelle Tumlo. She's going to be a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford next year. So this Jesus. is a young woman who went to Army West Point and she's crushed it in the classroom. She's an amazing uh, teammate. She is going to Oxford, which is the most prestigious and oldest graduate uh, scholarship program in the world. And I think they take like the, the smallest amount of, of, of American um, undergrads every single year. And she's graduating from West Point. So that's a story that you'll, you'll hear. And there's, there's a ton that. of them. I'm, wow. I'm, I'm Clark, that's of, awesome, man. Yeah, I'm in the mix of, of the finding good stuff, stuff. Clark. I love that. Yeah. So it's, it's going to be called what's good. And I think that's going to be fun, but we'll, we'll certainly, uh, we'll certainly be up to some of the old shenanigans as well. Love it. I love it. I love it, man. I love it. Dude, Kark, I am so pumped that you came on, brother. So pumped to you. you. At least, I'm not going to lie to you, man. Like, I, I'm feeling good that I have a little grace here because I'm looking at you right now, and you're like, oh, you're like no. a handsome lad, man. You're all, you got the gray, you're like the gray fox. Thank you. I needed that today, Kark. You look great. Tell your <laughs> wife I told you that. I, I, I will <laughs> remind her. I'm like, hey. Scott, Scotty and Danny, are you looking to get a little grays in here? I got I, some. I actually I, use I'm just for my touch of gray. I keep it out. Why don't you? Why don't you like to – you don't want them? I'm you got to get I'm married. Not. That's when the gray really it's, comes it's, in. Dude, I act like I'm 22 years old. It wouldn't help. Danny, how old are you? I'm 27. 27. So, yes. The day I, the day I got married, the next morning I woke up and my sideburns were gray. I felt <laughs> I was old. I felt I was old until I joined the podcast with these two guys. So, then they oh, make me feel young again. Yeah. And then we learn you're playing Pokemon. So yeah. <laughs> Keep playing Pokemon. Cool. Well, Clark – I have something for you to finish with. I'm calling the game, the color, this weekend between Villanova and Penn State, Greg and I's alma maters. I want some constructive criticism from you. I, I want some notes from you. And that's I'd love a big, to hear That's it. a big game. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you one little bit of advice that I had a friend who introduced me to uh, Jim Cott. Do you know who he is? He's an all-time Yankee guy that, that pitched – I don't even know how many years he pitched in the majors, over 20 so he was the voice of the Yankees for many years. When I started getting into this business, he told me the best advice that I'm going to share with you. When you're doing this game, pretend that there are three people on a couch watching. Someone who's never seen the sport of lacrosse. The average fan who would be like a, a, a parent that's probably watching lacrosse for a long time, knows enough to be dangerous. And then there's the lunatic who, who calls out razor picks in his sleep like, like Jamie Monroe. Okay? <laughs> Try to talk to each one of those people throughout the course of the game. Don't spend too much time on the person who's never been there. Don't spend too much time on the average man. Don't spend too much time on the lunatic. Give them all a taste of, of the sport and, and weave it in throughout the course of the game. And, and I think that's the best way to get viewers to, to embrace the sport because this is still a new sport for many people. That's phenomenal advice. And Sibes, also, just if you're a betting man, Penn State, four and a half. You're a Dude, they looked good You're last week. Degenerate. Uh, they look good. Your, your boy Hudson Bond played well, right? Hudson looks very good. Hudson looks very good. When he keeps his feet planted and just gets in and out, he can be an offensive juggernaut. But Nova's got a pretty decent faceoff guy, too. So it'll be interesting. Yeah. yeah. One people. last thing, Danny. When, when you're calling the game, don't tell us what we all saw. Tell us how and why it happened. Love it. Look at no, that. Clark, that's awesome advice. I, you know, I should have taken notes. So I'm going to have to listen to this back before, before I go <laughs> on. But no, I appreciate that so much. I really do. This has been a pleasure having you on. Awesome talking to you. It's been a blast, man. I hope we have you on again. You could be our first recurring yeah, guest. How about that? Sure, man. I, I'm, I'm always here and, and, and love what you guys do. And you're all very different in your own ways, but you, you all kind of just come together and, and, and make it work. Yeah, I'm Clark. excited to text Kark during games. I have a terrible habit of that. I'll get back to you during a break. I know. <laughs> I know you will. During a break. He's done it to me. <laughs> I love All it. All right, brother. Well, thank you so hey, much, guys. man. It was great talking to you. Love you, Kark.